Cynthia, for somebody that's been intermittent fasting, but maybe they haven't been getting the results they wanted or expected or just could get, and we're going to get into some of those benefits throughout our conversation, what do you find are the biggest things that are holding people back from getting the best results when it comes to fasting? Oh, goodness. There are so many different things I can think of. I would say that it starts with basics. So if they're not sleeping well, and by that, I mean high quality, you know, good amount of deep and REM sleep. And, you know, obviously I track everything on an aura. You don't necessarily need an aura or whoop band, but are you waking up refreshed or do you feel like you're dragging in the morning? So under sleeping that understand that sleep is foundational to our health and how many women in particular start really struggling with sleep issues north of 40 years old. So if you're not getting high quality sleep, irrespective of gender, that's number one. I would say number two is a lot of people still think they can eat like they're 18 years old. And uh, I hate to be like a bummer, but I'm here to tell you that what we eat is equally as important as when we eat. And so if someone is being diligent about high quality protein, healthy fats, the right types of carbohydrates, they're oftentimes going to have much better success than someone that's still eating hyper palatable, highly processed foods. Because even if you're eating within a compressed feeding window, if you're eating inflammatory foods, and, and this could be very unique for each one of us, people may think they're eating a healthy diet, but they're still consuming a lot of dairy, um, a great deal of like gluten and grains. Maybe they're consuming too much alcohol. Uh, and I think coming off, off the past three years, that has certainly been the case when I start talking to patients about their alcohol consumption. So I think macros do matter. And I think the the choices that we're making, obviously, if you're more insulin sensitive, you can get away with a bit more discretionary carbohydrate than someone who is not. And we know that only 7% of Americans right now are metabolically healthy. And so really understanding when I'm talking to different types of patients, Someone that's struggling with weight loss resistance and is, is obese and overweight is probably going to have to be very cognizant of their carbohydrate intake versus a very athletic, lean individual who is insulin sensitive. The other things that um, are, are common for me to see, along with that alcohol piece, are uh, just uh, you know adverse childhood events. So understanding the complex interrelationship between trauma. Uh, and trauma really is a scar uh, for people to understand that trauma doesn't have to be big T trauma. You know, I trained at a big research institution and I thought if you haven't experienced going through uh, a significant trauma, like you've been raped, um, you experienced uh, profound neglect, um, you were involved in, you know, a, a loved one having uh, gone through a suicide or something very significant, then you didn't experience trauma. Well, there's there's little T trauma that can be equally as um, impactful. And so if you really look at the research, individuals that have a, a high adverse childhood event score are more at risk for not only autoimmune conditions, but also um, weight loss resistance. And that can be for many different factors. And then I would say the other more common thing that I will see with some regularity is dirty fasting. And so people don't don't like me to talk about this, but I'm going to because I think it's so important to understand that if you are weight loss resistant, what you eat in your fasting time frame is important. So there are bars out there that are marketed to people as being a fasting bar. And I always say that's an oxymoron because you're not meant to eat in a fast or people are having copious amounts of fatty coffees. So whether it's butter, ghee, um, heavy cream, um, there are calories in these healthy fats, right? And so understanding that if you are weight loss resistant and you're trying to lose weight and you're having a 300 calorie fatty coffee every morning and you're trying to figure out like, okay, I, I only eat in this very narrow feeding window, but I'm also having this very fatty coffee, which is why I'm not hungry, which is why I'm not having two meals in my in my feeding window. And so I think that can um, oftentimes be problematic. And there are influencers out there who tell patients that if it's under 50 calories, it doesn't matter. And so again, I go back to understanding what is a clean fast. And I think a clean fast is the type of fast that you want to engage with or engage in rather when you are weight loss resistant so that you are getting rid of extraneous things that could potentially be contributing to why you are struggling to lose weight. So I think those are 
probably the most common things that I see. Um, the other little piece that I would probably tie in there is chronic stress. Again, coming off this three years of, um, you know, post pandemic, out of the pandemic, hopefully never have to see the pandemic, a, a pandemic again in our lifetime. Uh, chronic unrelenting stress, reminding people that acute stress isn't a, isn't a bad thing, but chronic unrelenting stress. You're going through a divorce, you lost your job, um, you just have a stressful situation. I can tell my cortisol's up because I get jittery. Well, guess what happens when our cortisol goes up? Get us, guess what also goes up? Your blood sugar correspondingly, because your body is is actively engaged, thinking there's some type of a predatory threat, and then your fasting and in, your insulin goes up. So understanding that chronic stress can be a huge contributor and really encouraging people to um, find ways to decompress their their lifestyle as much as possible. I think that we don't talk enough about this and we expect people to just figure it out. And I, I think in our over harried, over stressed, exi- sympathetic, dominant existences, helping people understand that chronic unrelenting stress can be at the basis for why you are not getting the body composition changes that you're looking for, really struggling with that scale being stuck. All these things can occur at the same time, but that's another major contributor that I think a lot of individuals aren't thinking about because they just go about their lives thinking everyone has stress. Stress isn't a big deal. And I remind people like if your stress is impacting your sleep, which is impacting your food choices, it's this, you know, big circle. It's like the circle of you know, discomfort. It's like all these different things are are kind of creating the perfect environment for your body to just hold on to the calories or hang on to the fat that you're trying to get rid of and not understanding that oftentimes it's choices that we're making day to day that can impact that in pretty significant ways. Currently over 90% of the people that are watching these videos aren't subscribed to the channel. If you're one of these people and you've been enjoying the episodes, please take a second and subscribe below. This is going to help the community continue to grow and help the show continue to bring on the biggest guests. Thank you ahead of time. Continue to enjoy this episode with Cynthia. For people that, you know, who just took all that in and are feeling overwhelmed on where to begin, say they're holding on to extra weight and they just feel like, okay, this is great. I want to begin. I want to start, but I want to start small with, with the biggest levers that are going to make the biggest impact. How would you recommend that person get started and then over time assess what you just talked about and look at some of the more nuanced pieces just so they can get that inertia moving for them and start to lose weight and start to get their energy back and feel better? Yeah, I think it's a really good point that we start small because it is overwhelming to make a lot of changes all at once. So sleep is foundational. That is the first thing we work on. If people come to me and they want to start fasting and they're in groups, I'm like, nope, got to sleep first. So the most important thing you can do is get high quality sleep. And yes, that is going to involve making some lifestyle changes. It may be that you need to be in bed 30 to 60 minutes earlier than you have been. And so it's as structured as, you know, thinking about us as parents, you know, you have a a daughter, I have um, a couple teenagers. When they were babies and toddlers, there were things that we did in their lives that told them or gave their body cues that it's time to gear down and go to bed. And so I I teach adults to kind of think the same way about strategically about their own sleep habits. So when you get up in the morning, I want you to start thinking about sleep for that evening. So that means getting light exposure in the morning. You're getting outside. I don't care if you sit on your front steps and you just drink your cup of coffee or your type of or your tea or you just sit there with your your you know your child or your pet, but get some light exposure on your retinas first thing in the morning because that will help suppress melatonin and increase cortisol, tells your body it's time to get up and get moving. And then also at the end of your day, if you're able to, you know, we've had daylight savings and it's a little lighter out um, a little later, you know, maybe you're watching the sunset or maybe you're getting outside at dusk. It's kind of reminding your body that, that we're kind of making this transitional from being light outside to being dark outside understanding that you want to sleep in a cold, dark room. Now, in my house, we sleep at 65 degrees. Everyone sleeps really well, really, really well. And that has been our normal for probably the past 10 years. We, I also sleep with a sleep mask. Now, being a guy, that might not be something that you're interested in, but we make sure like our landscaping lights are out by 11 o'clock. You know, that helps that we have shutters on our windows. So everything is closed. Being in the dark is very important. Understand you might need to add rituals. So, um, sometimes 
using magnesium spray. Um, I love to talk about magnesium, but we know magnesium, most of us are depleted in magnesium at pretty significant and profound levels, especially if we're dealing with this chronic stress, even organic, organically grown fruits and vegetables are grown in soils that are magnesium depleted. So if you assume because you're eating all organic that you're you're not having to deal with this, I assure you that you probably need more magnesium. Maybe it's magnesium spray or magnesium oil. I like both uh, transdermal or skin absorbed magnesium as well as oral magnesium. I think about other things that are helpful, like in terms of supplementation, like myelinositol is very helpful. Um, you know, thinking about soaking in magnesium if you're not using a spray, thinking about oral magnesium, thinking about getting off electronics. I know that may not be something that everyone can do every single night. I get it. That's why blue blockers are so effective. I mean, I wear them. My kids all, my kids laugh at me. They used to wear them, but now they're teens and I know nothing. So now we're at the stage where I'm the one wearing it in front of the TV and then I can go to bed after I watch um, watch a movie. Wearing blue blockers, which is going to help with uh, not suppressing melatonin and telling your body it's time to party. The other thing that I think is really helpful for sleep is understanding the interrelationship between chronobiology. So the the way that our body, we have these, we have clocks throughout our bodies. I think most people think about the penile gland, which is in the brain, but we have melatonin clocks or circadian clocks throughout our body and diffusely in the digestive system. So if you eat a large meal within two to three hours of bedtime, you have the potential. Again, I'm going to emphasize potential because I have teenagers who seem impervious to eating an hour before bed and still fall asleep, but they're also, you know, young, younger people. But understand the that interrelationship between meal timing and its impact on sleep. So if you are eating two hours before bed, getting reflux, not sleeping well, tossing and turning, it got your aura, your heart rate variability is all over the place. It could be that you have offset this 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 um, seesaw effect between melaton melatonin and cortisol. So if you eat that bolus of food, melatonin gets suppressed because your body's trying to trying to actually process all this food that you've consumed. So I do think that there's there's value in in you know closing your feeding window or having your last meal earlier in the evening or early later in the afternoon, depending on the individual. And those are typically the things I find are of greatest benefit to help with sleep support. Obviously, there are things that go beyond that. But those are easier things that most people can tangibly do that don't involve a lot of gadgets. I mean, I love gadgets, but I acknowledge not everyone else does. Um, I think this is like a heyday to you know being in the hospital. I like to measure things, but not everyone else does. So I think those things are a really good foundational principle to looking at sleep that I think most people could slowly one at a time do those things. The other thing that I think is important with sleep that I didn't mention is physical activity. So we are designed to move. We are not designed to be sedentary all day long. And so sometimes I'll have patients that will say, I have a sedentary job. And I'm like, then every hour, get up and walk stairs or walk around the circumference of your office or do something to break up the monotony of sitting all day long. So physical activity, obviously, I'm going to say strength training is going to be important, but just walking can be very, very helpful for ensuring that our bodies have exerted enough energy during the day that they need that restful, restorative sleep. And the last thing that I, I would say about sleep that I think is important is um, alcohol consumption. So we know that alcohol can be very disruptive to deep and REM sleep. For a lot of individuals, it can um, it allows them to fall asleep, but then they wake up. And I, I think that for anyone who's ever struggled with sleep, um, once you figured out what works for you, you, you really don't want to deviate because you acknowledge how much better you feel when you've had a good night of sleep. So understanding that alcohol consumption, although yes, it might be able to help you fall asleep, can disrupt sleep architecture enough that it can impact not only how you feel in the morning, but it can also um, impact your blood sugar, impacts leptin and, satiety, and leptin and ghrelin, which are these appetite and satiety hormones, and can impact your choices the next day. So when we don't sleep well, we don't crave broccoli and chicken, we're going to crave junk. And so just understanding that those kind of pieces can all work together, but maybe one at a time. Maybe you see if, okay, this reinforces good sleep. I want to do more of that. Um, and understanding you don't necessarily have to do every one, but I think that those components can really contribute to sleep quality in profoundly impactful ways. A lot of great stuff there. And I'll add a couple little caveats to that. 
One being when you talked about not eating right before bed, another piece of that that ties into our eating window is the fact that we're less insulin sensitive at night. So if we're having, if we're, we're going to get into eating windows and get into the nuances of intermittent fasting throughout our conversation, but moving that eating window, another reason beyond what you talked about is the fact we're more insulin sensitive and we're going to process that food better if we have it earlier in the day. Yeah. And it's interesting because I've been to events where I've been around um, other health and wellness professionals and there's always a unicorn, right? Um, I met Ben Greenfield about a year and a half ago and he was talking about how he has a large bolus of carbohydrates at night. Ben is a wonderful unicorn individual who's incredibly lean. He's also, I think, still in his 30s. But I think most of us, to your point, we are more insulin sensitive during the day. And that is, again, aligned with that circadian clocks in the body. And so I think that that's a really good point to help people understand that the average person does better eating, certainly eating carbohydrates earlier in the day, but also understanding that that insulin sensitivity piece is going to be important, especially as individuals are getting older and they are very likely losing some of their insulin sensitivity. What I really like about this piece of the conversation around sleep is the fact that we're talking about a lot of variables beyond the things that happen in bed or right before bed. You know, you talked about getting the daylight first thing in the morning. I think that's just so important for our sleep later on at night. And now we're talking about when we're we're having food and these are all different inputs. You mentioned exercise too. So it's looking at getting the right inputs at the right time throughout the day to sleep better at night. Yeah. And I, I think for a lot of individuals, they just, until they start having trouble with sleep, they don't even think about sleep. I certainly was one of those people until I got into my early 40s. I, as soon as my head hit the pillow, I woke up in the morning magically, I felt rested. And then all of a sudden that wasn't the case anymore. And so I started thinking very thoughtfully, what are the things I'm doing that are negatively impacting my sleep that I can change? You know, getting older is not one of them. So, you know, trying to think thoughtfully about what can I do? And then obviously, if you're doing all of those things and you're still having trouble sleeping, then we have to look a little bit deeper. And But most individuals will benefit enormously just with making those changes that we kind of started with starting the conversation. Because as you, as you appropriately stated, it's overwhelming when some wellness professional out there gives you 50 things you should be doing. You're like, okay, I can just work with one at a time and that's okay. I think it's very important to meet our patients and our clients where they are as opposed to you know, using this, I used to call it ivory tower You know, in medicine. That's the ivory tower answer. Well, that's great, but that's not realistic. So let's be realistic so that we can all ensure that everyone's getting better quality sleep. And you mentioned Ben Greenfield there being a unicorn. The other thing that brought up for me is the fact that when it comes to caffeine, we all metabolize it differently. And that's one of the common things you'll hear when people talk about sleep, making sure your caffeine is is within a window earlier in the day, which makes a lot of sense. But you also have the individual variability depending on how you metabolize that caffeine. Some people can push it a little later into the day, but I want people to be mindful if they are having trouble sleeping at night, that is an area you want to look to early on because it's, and it's obvious to a lot of people, but some people might be missing it. And what I found about the research surrounding caffeine is that if you're a slow metabolizer, it could take you 12 hours. Yes, 12 hours to metabolize the caffeine you consumed in the morning. I have a child who was a competitive swimmer until this past year, and he would have two or three espressos. I'm not kidding. He could have that in the evening because he loves the taste of espresso and he could go to bed. And I was amazed. I was like shocked. But I, I realized when we did genetic testing, both he and I are fast metabolizers of caffeine. I don't drink caffeinated things after two o'clock because I'm just too concerned that I might negatively impact my health. But what's interesting is there's definitely a genetics piece that plays into that. So if you think you're, if you're sensitive or you're a slow metabolizer, you definitely want to be cognizant of when you consume that last cup of coffee or tea or any other caffeinated beverage, um, you know, Red Bulls and other things that I tell my children that they shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> I'm glad we went deep into that sleep piece and probably not the obvious direction people would assume when we're going to have a conversation primarily about fasting, but it's, it's critically important. And what I want to talk about now is why we know how to sleep well. But let's talk now about the piece of why sleeping well is so important, specifically when it comes to somebody that's going to embrace fasting. 
I think that when we understand that intermittent fasting is a form of hormesis, so beneficial stress in the right amount at the right time, it's understanding that in order to gain all the benefits from fasting, you have to ensure that you're getting to a position with your lifestyle that your body is not overstressed because you're already adding a little bit more stress with the fasting piece. And so when we're approaching fasting, when I'm having conversations, it's it's trying to determine is someone optimized in order to have success with this? Because what sometimes happens is that someone becomes weight loss resistant and they they start getting into this mindset that if fasting is good, more is better. If restricting my calories is good, restricting more is better. If exercise is good, more is better. And so they get into trouble where their body is just so stressed physically and otherwise that they're not going to garner the benefits from an intermittent fasting lifestyle because they just haven't convinced their body that they're safe enough, that they're in this advantageous position, that they're going to be able to have success and also be able to effectively repair. Like one of the things people forget about when we're talking about fasting is a lot of times that you're fasting, you're sleeping, right? So if you're in this position where your your cortisol's up and you're not properly recovered from your workout and you're not getting enough sleep, that's going to negatively impact some of these physiologic benefits that go on with fasting that we don't see per se from the outside. And it impacts the way that our our brains detoxify and break down plaques and um, you know tau proteins and other things that that we're, our body is effectively getting rid of with sleep. So I do think that if you want to have success with intermittent fasting, one of the first boxes that must be checked is making sure that you're getting good quality restorative sleep so that your body is ready to kind of accept a little bit of horme- a little bit more hormesis. Hormesis are things or hermetic stressors are things that allow us to become stronger and more resilient, but we don't want to pour gasoline on a fire. That's that's usually the analogy I give is that your body thinks that you have just poured gasoline on a fire. So we've got to quiet everything down and then reintroduce this when we've already worked through all this inflammation and other things that are going on with you personally. And Cynthia, what would you say is the best barometer for somebody who has say even been listening to the show and taking on all these different forms of hermetic stress, whether it be the sauna, cold plunging, uh, fasting, exercise, there's so many different forms and they can all layer on and people over time can start to accumulate all these into their healthy routine. And in the right amount at the right time, of course, if the person has isn't overwhelmed with stress, they're good for the body. But how do people know whether they're pushing it too hard? Is it just waking up and feeling refreshed in the morning, whether the weight's coming off, if that's part of their goal right now with their health journey? How do they how do they assess that? It's such a good question. And you're right. Uh, You know, if if more is better then more is better. Right. Um, I I think a lot of it is. uh, And this isn't per se tangible, but this kind of flow state where, you know, you you don't have to force anything. You don't have to force the cold exposure. You don't have to force the fasting. You don't feel like you have to force anything. It just is something that you're attuned to. Um, I know that for me as an individual, I don't love cold weather. I don't like being cold. So I would say I probably need the 15 second tail end of my shower to be cold because that's going to challenge my body and I can walk away and not feel like my whole morning has been ruined, but I would never be one of those people that wants to be in a cold plunge pool. And that doesn't per se mean there's anything wrong with me. I just think for me, I don't need as much hormetic cold ex- uh, cold exposure to be able to garner their benefits because it's something that I genuinely don't enjoy, like not even a little bit, and I'll just be fully transparent. I think for each one of us, we have to look at what is your schedule like? Are you doing these things and you have plenty of time to do these things like the cold exposure, the infrared sauna, the doing high intensity interval training, lifting weights, um, intermittent fasting? If you feel like you're able to fit it into your lifestyle and you don't feel encumbered, you don't feel like you're stressed, I, I think that it's helpful to do a little bit of hormesis every day as opposed to spending like hours trying to get all these things done. I do have clients that will try to fit everything in and it's stressing them out so much that I'm like, all right, wait, time out. This is not probably 
the strategy we want to be forcing ourselves to do. Like, I don't believe white knuckling anything. You don't white knuckle fasting. You don't white knuckle the exercise. You don't white knuckle the heat exposure or the cold exposure because that's valuable bits of information your body is trying to tell you. And so I think that there's a, there's a healthy amount of optimization and then I think it becomes obsessive. And I, I definitely, within the past year, I've met individuals where I've had to say, I think this is this is gone from being a healthy endeavor to now this is you cannot you can't like your your life has gotten so programmed that you're not able to effectively change course or change or make corrections or have a social life because you have to get these five things in before you're willing to even start your day um I think it's so individual is really the answer I'm trying to provide so bioindividuality rules I know for myself, I think that um, not liking cold is there's probably some genetic susceptibility to that. And I've read research to suggest that, but I'm not going to force myself to do it. If I don't feel like doing it, I'm not going to do it. But I do have individuals where I'll say, well, why don't we just have one thing every day that you do, like as a starting point? Maybe you fast every other day. Maybe you do uh, infrared sauna twice a week. Maybe the other day you do cryotherapy or you do a cold shower. And then maybe the, on that seventh day, you do a little bit of high intensity interval training or strength training or whatever fits into your schedule and see what you like. Because unfortunately, whether it's an influencer or someone in the health and wellness space, a lot of our um, listeners desperately want to mimic what they see us doing. And that's why I think it's so important. And, and what's responsible to say is what works for your budget, what works for your lifestyle and your sanity. Because to suggest to everyone listening that you have to do these eight metrics every day is woefully unrealistic. I can't even do that every day. I can tell you the things I crave, the things that I know my body, like I like to exercise. So that's some that's a part of my lifestyle every day. But I don't per se force myself to do it. If I wake up and I don't feel good, then I back off on it. But I think it's important to kind of have that internal dialogue to see what feels and resonates with you and to understand that if you're trying to mimic what someone else is doing, there's no shame in that. But just understand that bioindividuality absolutely plays a part in all of this. And so finding what works best for you, I think, is very important. And I think a layer that adds some challenge to all this is the fact that social media, you mentioned influencers, people can post pictures of, you know, doing cryotherapy or jumping in the sauna. And, and that just represents one little part of the day. And that might be the part that they choose to highlight and then their followers are going to see that or and then maybe they'll look at another person they're following and seeing them doing something else. And and then people can get so overwhelmed thinking they're not doing enough and that they need to take on all these different modalities. And really, you're going to get the biggest bang from your buck oftentimes by getting the foundation right. Things like sleep and and intermittent fasting and having a solid diet and hydrating and it always comes back to the basics. And I think for a lot of people, seeing that can be an injustice because it sends them off in the right, wrong direction. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think a lot of people, as an example, want to see what I'm eating. Well, I never, I, I try when I'm sitting down and having a meal, I try not to have my phone next to me. And so um, sometimes I'll post like, this is what I broke my fast with. And then I don't, I forget to take a photo of what I ate later. And then people are in my DMs and my team are like, People really love to see what you eat. Um, and then we get questions, well, how did you grill that? Or what's the recipe? Or what's this? What's that? And so I, I think that we have a responsibility to kind of just be transparent and say, this is a snapshot of one thing that I did in my day. And it, it's not meant to do anything other than just show you transparently what I'm doing. This may not work for you. Like, I really like protein. I really like non-starchy vegetables. I don't feel deprived eating those things, but there are plenty of people who are like, I hate doing that. I don't want to eat more protein. I don't want to eat the non-starchy vegetables. I would do better having a higher fat diet. I'm like, that's great. That's not me. Um, and so I, I think that we have to be responsible citizens and kind of disclose what works. People always, as an example, they want to see what I'm doing in the gym. And I struggle with this because I'm an introvert. And when I get to the gym, the last thing I want to do is take a photo of myself or a video while I'm doing something because it just, that's just not me, but people want to see it. And I said to my husband, you know, we now live in a different city and the gym that I go to is really, it's like a bro gym and there's nothing wrong with that. 
But, you know, to be like posing and do it just it's not me. It's not authentic. And so I think that we, we owe it to ourselves to share what we feel comfortable with, but also have some healthy boundaries and just say, I'm not going to show everything. Um, I try to be as transparent as possible. But I think realistically, there are very susceptible individuals on social media that see what we're doing and then they want to replicate that for themselves. And I always say the power of the N of one is a beautiful thing. But if you do what I do and you don't feel good doing it, well, that's valuable information, right? Don't force yourself to do it. Maybe you don't feel good with fasting. Maybe you need less sleep. Maybe you're a magical unicorn and you need less sleep. And there is a small subsect of the population that needs like less than six hours a night of sleep, but that's a really small subsect of the population. Most people aren't that way. And so I think part of the responsibility of um, you know, existing in this space is just telling people like trial and error. That's what I tell people all the time. Try it out. See what works. It's so different than when I was in clinical medicine and it was like almost everyone got, if you had coronary artery disease, you got these five things. Or if you had high blood pressure, this is the algorithm of medications we would do. And I started to just understand that there's so much that's innately different about each one of us that we can't have a one size fits all. And I think the same thing applies to lifestyle. And the other layer too, when it comes to influencers is a lot of times what people don't know or might not know is these products are sent to us for free to test and to show. And this, for people like me and you, this is our work and our life all twisted into one. So, you know, it's part of our job to test different things and to experiment so we know, you know, so we can share with the audience and we can learn for ourselves and then share what we're learning. So for somebody who is working a nine to five job and then they would expect themselves to, you know, come home and, and make dinner for the family and, and to keep up with some of the things that we're doing because this is what we do, that's very unrealistic. And I think it's too much pressure on people. It really is. It's funny. My, so my mom is retired, but she was here for a couple of days this week. And when she comes to visit, I always like to share with her the things I've enjoyed receiving most recently. And sometimes I'll send her home with some samples. And I'm like, if you like this, I will get it for you because she's retired and she is now on a budget. She's never been on a budget. So now she's on this budget. And she's just amazed. I mean, she's in a, a different, um, you know, different age group. Um, she worked for a big healthcare organization. I mean, she just never had these kinds of things that show up magically at her front door. And it just, she marvels at it. She just, I'll say to her, you know, we were trying to take pictures. I have a new podcast um, sponsor. And so I was taking pictures. We were making recipes with the the ingredients. And my mom was trying to, try, lovingly trying to, help me create these shots. And I was like, no, no, I know exactly what I need. I have to put the product and the recipe and this and that. I've said it to my team. And she was just fascinated. She was like, wow, like you can really be very creative in this space. And I said, yes, you have the ability to have a lot of creativity, which is a blessing and a curse. But you're right to your point that a lot of what we do in our day to day may not be realistic for someone that's working a totally different kind of job. Like my husband works, um, you know, he works for a, a large consulting company and he just happens to work from home. So our lifestyle kind of beautifully kind of interplays. But if we were still working out, if I were still seeing patients in the hospital and he was still working, you know, 30 minutes away from home, um, we wouldn't be able to do some of the things that we do. Uh, we just wouldn't have that much flexibility. So I think that's a really good point to just acknowledge that, um, you know, each one of us have different jobs and different roles. And, and there are things about our um, our kind of podcasting duties that allow us to have a bit more flexibility in some areas than others do. Cynthia, I think at this point, a good framework for the next part of our conversation is to talk about, you mentioned people being interested in what you're eating. And this is something I'm sure that changes and pivots over time. But let's talk about where you're at now with when you break your fast, what you're eating. And then we can use again that as a platform to dive into different areas and talk about different aspects of fasting and, and diet. Yeah. I mean, right now I am, uh, I use the term carnivore-ish and it's really because I eat a lot of animal-based protein. That's what works really well for my body. Um, whether it's bison or steak or pork or chicken or fish. I mean, I, I like to kind of mix things up. I really genuinely like vegetables, which is why I could never be full carnivore again. Um, and the tail end of that is I was full carnivore after being hospitalized because nothing else worked for my digestive system. But I really like vegetables and I like, I actually like fruit. 
um, and I tolerate both really well. I do better on a leaner diet, so leaner cuts of meat, leaner cuts of fish. Um, I don't do as well with a lot of healthy fats. So when I do have healthy fats, it's smaller portions, and that's just what makes me unique. Um, and, and that's been a lot of trial and error over the last several years. So when I break a fast, I'm going to sit down with, today I had um, grilled bison and I had some hard boiled eggs. I'm going through an egg phase. I intermittently kind of go through an egg phase. I think I need, I must need, need more choline in my diet. So I sat down and had um, a bison burger. I had three deviled eggs. I had some leftover broccolini and that was my lunch um, or when I broke my fast. And that to me is perfect. And I'll eat another bolus of food later this afternoon after you know playing my mom role. But that's kind of what I've been working best with right now is a good amount of protein. I would say 100 to 110 grams of protein a day for me, just based on my ideal body weight. And then, you know, as much non-starchy vegetables as I want. And I've been experimenting more with fruit. Um, I had not been eating a lot of fruit for a while. But right now I'm in a berry phase. Lots of raspberries and blueberries are what I really enjoy. Even just green bananas. Like I think bananas have been largely vilified but I love a just green banana and it probably makes me sound like a total weirdo, but that's when it's a lot less starchy. Um, there's just something about it. Like it's literally when it's just gone from green ish to a little bit yellow, that's perfect for me. And those are the things that, that work really well for me. And I always encourage people to experiment, see, you know, if is your, are your satiety cues kind of met with the amount of protein that you're eating for me? I am so full when I'm done eating, there's no way I could eat more food. Um, it's interesting when I travel though, I will say with full disclosure, I've started ordering a second thing of protein. Like I was in a restaurant, um, last month and I had a, a naked burger on my plate and I looked at the waitress and I said, can I get a side of shrimp or some chicken? Because this burger was so small, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not hitting that 40, 50, 60 grams of protein in that meal. So there's been a great deal of experimentation, but that's what works best for me right now. And definitely breaking my fast is with a protein dense meal, usually with some carbohydrate, but usually in the form of vegetables. So you've really hit home the importance of protein when you break your fast. Let's talk about why that is. I think it was 40, 50, 60 grams. Why do you aim for so high? What is that doing for you? Yeah. So, um, so for me, I'm very protective of my muscle. And the one thing that I have learned from being friends with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon over the last several years is that Protein is so incredibly important. Our protein needs actually increase with age. You know, it's not that they go away. My protein needs probably as a 51-year-old female are much more than they were even 10 years ago. So protein is important for me because I'm aiming for 110 grams a day. Um, and I kind of teach people that you want more protein than you probably realize. So I want to make sure that each meal has 50 to 60 grams of protein. That's ideally what I'm shooting for. Number one, for supportive muscle protein synthesis. Number two, for satiety, because the one thing that people may or may not realize is that as you are losing estrogen in perimenopause at, towards the tail end and into menopause, and as this hormone called follicular stimulating hormone is going up, it will drive the need for protein needs will continue to increase. If you don't get your protein met, guess what? You're going to crave fat and carbohydrates. And it's important to understand that those things tend to be hyper palatable. Meaning if I sit down and have a bunch of chips and guacamole, although delicious, that is not going to give my body the macros that it needs to be able to continue to build muscle. What's important to understand about muscle is that muscle helps with insulin sensitivity. So as we are losing muscle north of 40, you know, this process of sarcopenia, our bodies are effectively replacing lean muscle tissue with adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, um, although, you know, if you're looking at a filet mignon, which is, you know, lean muscle, a ribeye, all them delicious, that's not what we want our muscles to turn into because we start to lose muscle um, insulin sensitivity, we will become more insulin resistant. There are all these hormonal changes that are occurring, especially for women as they are transitioning from perimenopause to menopause. And so for me, it's helping individuals understand whether you're a man or a woman, you know, andropause is a real thing. Menopause is a real thing. And the way to get ahead of that is to make sure you're eating enough protein, you're getting high quality sleep, and you're lifting heavy things. And that always seems to be a triggering kind of trio because people say, I don't want to lift weights. And I'm like, I don't care if you do bodyweight exercise. 
I've got my, you know, 76 year old mom doing body weight exercise and she's slowly kind of improving upon her sarcopenic muscle. But it's helpful to understand this is where me as an intermittent fasting expert, I will differentiate from the longevity experts because to me, it is far more important to be hitting those protein metrics than it is to be having just one meal a day, than it is to be losing, continuing to lose muscle mass as I get older. I think that on a lot of different levels, um, these frank conversations are important so that people understand those hormones that I'm referring to, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, whether it's cortisol, melatonin, as these things are changing throughout our lifetime, they can positively or negatively impact how we are aging, whether that's accelerated. You know, if you're losing muscle and you're losing insulin sensitivity, you're increasing inflammation, you're increasing oxidative stress. We have a whole generation of providers and also women who are fearful to talk about hormones, let alone talk about replacing hormones. And so helping people understand very transparently, because I tell I'm very comfortable talking about what I've done that's worked and what I've done that has not worked. I think it's helpful for people just to start the conversation with, if you want to maintain insulin sensitivity and you want to maintain lean muscle, you have to change your relationship with protein and you have to change your relationship with the types of exercise that you're doing and also really focusing on sleep. And those three things can be very, very helpful to ensure that you remain metabolically healthy. And I think that's something that you and I really share is a passion for helping people understand what are the things you can do to help support your health as you're getting older. Well, I definitely want to take some time later on in our conversation to talk about metabolic health. And you mentioned insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance. I, I really want to get into those as well. But before we do, I want to make sure we really get into some of the nuances of what you're eating and when you're eating. So we kind of have an idea now of the food piece, but let's go back to, let's just go right through your day. I think that'd be helpful and talk about what you're having before you break your fast, when you break your fast. You mentioned exercise, that being a big piece of all of this. When are you exercising? I really want us, before we get into the next piece, to have a good feeling for what a day looks like. Okay, so this is the this is a typical day in my life. Obviously, um, it's a great question. I'm happy to answer it. But remember, this is what works for me at this stage in my life. So this may not work for someone else. So I'm typically up between 5 and 6 a.m., um, usually the first thing I do is I get my dogs out for a walk and it's important that I get out like as the sun is kind of rising. So my dogs get anywhere from a one and a half to two mile walk. And then I'm getting sunlight exposure on my retinas. I'm not wearing sunglasses depending on how hot or cold it is. That's how long the walk is. I come home, I feed them. Um, I have teenagers, they feed themselves and go off to school. And then usually whatever exercise I'm doing that day, whether it's a day where I'm doing more recovery work, or if it's a day I'm going lifting, I try to aim to lift two to three days a week minimum. Um, I also really like doing Pilates. I probably should be doing that two, twice a week because I actually mentally that's good for me because um, it's challenging, but in different ways. Um, I get quite a bit of walking in. So for me, I'm aiming to have seven to 8,000 steps done in the morning because that kind of allows me to kind of gauge how much more physical activity I need during the day. Um, after I've gotten my workout done, I really love laying on a PMF mat. And if anyone's wondering what that is, it's a mat that has ions that are actually helping to support the mitochondria. It's incredibly relaxing. And for me, it, it, it kind of reminds my body, depending on the settings, okay, this is, this is kind of a little bit of a recovery before I take a shower. So usually in the shower by nine o'clock in the morning, shower, get myself ready for the day, whatever it is I'm doing, household stuff, if it's laundry or other things. Um, I am always, as soon as I get up in the morning, I'm drinking water. Um, I have a little bit of mild dysautonomia. Uh, I don't have POTS, so I don't have postural orthostatic hypotension that a lot of individuals do. But I've always craved electrolytes, and I, I never knew why. And so I've been working with a new functional medicine doctor, and the first thing he said, you know, he just mentioned a couple things about my history, and he's like, I think you actually have mild dysautonomia and some degree of hypermobility and I've got some gut stuff. And so he said, you kind of have created this triad that he sees. And so for me, electrolytes are an important part of my day. I drink them throughout the day. Obviously in a fasted state, it's the unflavored variety, but I add a lot of, like when I tell you a lot of electrolytes, a lot. Um, and so I'm drinking that all the way throughout the day. 
I usually now break my fast a little earlier than I used to. Usually 9 30, 10 30, 11 is usually my sweet spot, depending on what's on my calendar. That's when I'll sit down and have 50, 60 grams of protein. Um, I'll have those non starchy vegetables. My one vice in life is dark chocolate. And so I allow myself to have a little bit of dark chocolate every day. And I have zero shame about that. I, there's a lot of things I don't eat, um, but I love dark chocolate. And that's something that makes me happy. Get a little bit of a dopamine hit and then I can kind of tackle my day. And most of my day is working in my business. If it's a Monday through Friday, I usually start to kind of gear down around 3.30 because I have a kiddo that has to be picked up from school. And I may or may not you know, eat before I pick them up or eat after. It just really depends on how the day is structured. On the weekends, we're very diligent about family meals during the week. It's because we have so many different schedules, sports events, things. It just, it's kind of a grab and go culture, um, which used to not be the case. But now that I have teenagers, we've had to kind of make some accommodation. So that last meal could be at four o'clock. It could be at five o'clock. It could be at six o'clock. And again, I'll have the same kind of plug and play, you know, 50 to 60 grams of protein, more non-starchy vegetables, lots of water. During my feeding window, I will have electrolytes with some stevia in them, and I'm okay with that. I love fresh squeezed lemon in my water. Um, I'm happy to talk about all the electrolytes I take because I, I try a, differ, a couple different ways to get them all in. I can tell by my HRV, my heart rate variability, how much hydration I've gotten. Um, and so that's, that's a typical day. And then usually I'm gearing down for bed. I like to be upstairs, may not in bed, maybe not per se in bed nine ish. I like to be in bed lights out by nine 30 or 10. Um, this week was unusual that I had, uh, my mom was in town. My mom doesn't go to bed early. And then we had my older son had a lacrosse game. And so I think I was in bed at like quarter of 11 and I definitely feel differently when I get up, when I go to bed later. So that's a typical day. Um, two, usually large boluses of food. Um, yes, I'm very cognizant of to ensure I'm getting plenty of food in. Um, and some days I would say the average day I get two large boluses of food, which sounds terrible, two large meals. Um, and then at least one day a week, I, I refer to it as a refeeding day and refeeding makes me sound like I'm an animal in the zoo, but it's really a day I will have a bit more protein. I will account for another meal and it could be maybe that's a day I have a protein shake and then two large meals or maybe it's a day I just sit down and have I, I'm kind of going through this egg phase as I mentioned maybe I have four four you know eggs or maybe I have an omelet maybe I have five eggs just depends on how hungry I am but it's definitely with the understanding that I'm very kind of aware of how my body feels has my recovery from workouts has my sleep quality um, but the hydration and protein are two very consistent things that I really actively work towards. I have a 60 ounce glass pitcher that sits on my counter and that's how I'm able to kind of get a sense for how much water I'm consuming throughout the day. So the expectation is by the time I go to bed, I have finished that. So I'm drinking it throughout the day, which I think is really just very important for me. Um, as an example, I was out in Denver. I live on the East Coast, but I was out in Denver last month. And my mom grew up in Denver. I've gone to Denver hundreds of, well, maybe not hundreds of times, many times throughout my lifetime because I have family there. I had an altitude headache. I struggled. My HRV was in the toilet. My sleep quality was off. And it was because I could not, like, I could not catch back up for the hydration piece. And so for three days, I had the headache, the hydration, electrolytes. I was doubling up on electrolytes. And it was interesting to see that at altitude, I was really struggling because I travel quite a bit. And I don't normally have that much trouble, but it was really interesting to see the net impact on how I felt because I just couldn't get ahead of the curve. But generally speaking, that's kind of how my days are structured. Now, if I'm traveling, obviously different. Weekends are different because it's so important for us to sit down with our children and eat. Um, and it's just, it's a slower pace. Like during the week, it's very purposeful. It's like, okay, I have 30 minutes. I'm going to sit down and eat my meal. And, and I think it's very important that I don't rush through eating. I don't like to eat in my car. I don't like to eat at my desk. I think it's important to just unplug. Maybe I read a book. Um, just very, very important to make sure my, my body is relaxed when I'm consuming food so that it can properly kind of assimilate and break down when I'm eating. This is great. I love all the detail here. I think we went over some of this last time we talked, but this obviously is always changing, like I mentioned before, and, and we're getting into all kinds of detail we haven't covered. 
couple areas I really want to make sure we dive deeper into, one being the electrolyte piece. They kept coming up, and I don't remember specifically them coming up last time. So I'm curious, is this a newer addition for you or just something you're making more of a priority in the last bit? And then it sounds like you're having them throughout the day. Are you drinking plain water too, or is it electrolytes all all the time? It is electrolytes all the time. I've always... It's interesting. I even before um, intermittent fasting, I because of cardiology, because of my background and knowing what I knew about my patients, I was like, you know, I would recommend salting their food, which was completely contrary to what we're typically telling our patients, you know, high quality salt. But I crave salt and it's my adrenals are healthy. That's not the issue. I think I've always I've always needed them. And I intuitively understood that because this new physician that I'm working with, he laughed when we asked me what I ate in a day. And he said, I think it's really interesting that you are this attuned to your body. You understand how much better you feel when you're consuming electrolytes as opposed to not. So when I look at my day, I literally have, I don't know if you've ever heard of Quintin ampules. So you can get hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic water. They're little ampules that you break them off I add that to my water, you know, in an unfed state because there's nothing that's flavoring them. It's pretty benign. Um, I add uh, element uh, to my water in an, in an unfed and a fed state. So obviously uh, the the unsweetened element is pretty salty. So that has to be diluted in a lot of water. Uh, but yeah, all day long I'm drinking electrolytes. I even have other trace minerals that I'll add. And what I, what I found is interesting is that I sleep better my HRV is better. I'm a lot more alert when I'm hydrating like this all during the day. But I understand now that there's something unique about my physiology that I actually need more than the average person. And someone had once said, well, is it because you're low carb because you've got these renal losses of sodium? And I said, well, now I'm, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm consistently low carbohydrate. For listeners, if they're familiar, when you go lower carbohydrate, you're actually breaking down and depleting glycogen stores. And with glycogen um, being broken down, you'll get renal losses of sodium and other electrolytes. And I said, I can tell if I'm if I'm really low carb, I can tell in my body, I'll just start urinating more often. I said, that's not what this is about. I think this is just what's unique to, to me and my lifestyle. But I find that fasting in general, if someone's fasting and not using electrolytes, it can be a big game changer. People just feel better. And we're mentally clear. They have less cramping. Um, and so the, the longer I've done this, the more I've just realized is that, that this might be my magical unicorn properties is that I consume a lot of electrolytes throughout the day, but and not in a way that's raised my blood pressure or um, and not in a way that inhibits my ability to go to bed at night. I don't wake up to urinate. So I know I'm, I'm hitting the right threshold for me, but I acknowledge if someone were to see because uh, my mother was asking a lot of questions. If someone were to see what I do in a given day, they would probably be surprised. You mentioned Element there. They're a longtime sponsor of the show. I'm actually drinking Element right now. Big fan. How many packs would you go through a day? <laughs> um, at least three, sometimes four. And that's on top of Quintin ampules. That's on top of trace minerals. Uh, I've even got um, my... My physician even has me on some vitamin C. So I've got like a lot of mineral support just in general. And and to to his credit, actually, since he added a couple new mineral supplements, I actually feel really good. So I'm like, okay, this is actually working towards that. But, you know, when I was in Denver, I was consuming probably eight a day because I was doubling up because I, I knew what was happening. I was like, my body's dehydrated and it's not acclimating to altitude as as readily as I thought it would. I was like, okay, I will never be, uh, probably not going to Machu Picchu anytime soon, uh, which is even a higher elevation. But, you know, as to your point, I think that for each one of us, it's finding that sweet spot. I have some people that will just consume one element a day and that's as much as they tolerate. And so I think it's the power of the N of one and just understanding that you know, we, each one of us has kind of like unique needs that um, if we're tuning into what our body's trying to communicate can really make a big difference. And for me, electrolytes are total game changers. So when I travel, especially when I travel overseas or I'm doing longer trips, um, that's how I can kind of gauge how much water I'm consuming. So I always bring that glass container, which, you know, to my teenagers is so embarrassing. They're like, oh, there goes mom with her electrolytes. I'm like, that's right. 
<laughs> so just to make sure I'm clear, this big container has the Quintin ampules, which is something I'm going to look yep. into. I haven't heard of them before. The element and then trace minerals. Mm -hmm. What yeah. what's, uh, kind of trace minerals? So it's just a product that has, um, you know, bioavailable potassium, sodium, magnesium, and chloride. And um, the trace minerals are things like manganese and lithium. Um, I take a separate vitamin C supplement. And you may or may not know, vitamin C is one of these supplements that if you take too much, it can actually give you diarrhea. So it's it's very, it's like this, I, I take a capsule because the powders, I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. It's a little too, it's a little less specific. So, you know, for me, it, it's finding what's the right combination for me. But I acknowledge when I say to other people, this is what I do. It's like, wow, that's that's a lot of different steps. However, because I feel good, that's why it just reinforces like this is this is physician sanctioned. So objectively, my physician has signed off on this with the acknowledgement that he's like, you figured out for yourself what you need, like your little like cocktail of electrolytes that you consume during the day that that work best for you. Oh, and I love lemon. So I I have a lot of lemon squeezed into my water. For some reason, that's like perfect. And what do you use for a base of the water? Is it like a Berkey water filter system or reverse osmosis? Just since yeah. we've gotten into the nuances here, let's get the full <laughs> picture. So it's interesting that you asked that question. So it's always filtered water, but um, I had our water tested and my new functional medicine doctor wanted an even an even more involved test. There was like eight different vials of water that had to be tested. And so I'm still waiting to get that report because he wanted that report to then determine what we were going to get. I, I just wanted to get a whole house Aquasana system. My husband didn't want anything on our counter. So our Berkey did not make its way from our last house. And so we're kind of in this gray area right now waiting to figure that out. The first um, test that we did, uh, which he felt like didn't test enough things, should have some cadmium. So cadmium is a heavy metal. Um, and he felt like there was probably the area of Virginia that I live in is has some, there's probably a strong likelihood there's more heavy metals than, than what we realized. So um, to this date, I don't yet have that report. I'm told it should be back next week. It's like a three, takes like three weeks to test all these things. But literally there's this massive box that shows up that you then have to put all these eight vials of things, you know, out of the kitchen sink, out of this other sink, we have a brand new house. So I don't anticipate we're going to have um, any contaminants that were related to copper pipes or things like that. So it's been a very interesting journey. And I just say this really humbly, like as a clinician, going through this process has been very interesting. Let's talk about the stevia piece. You mentioned when you're in your fasting window, you're having the unflavored electrolytes, which opens up the bigger question, stevia, how do you feel about it in general? And then because I'm somebody, I mentioned the element big fan. I have the flavored ones. I actually don't consume the unflavored ones only because I like all the different flavors, even when I'm fasting. So this might be, this is probably going to be a new piece for me to implement when I'm fasting to get the unflavored ones. Why, why does that matter? Well, I think this is, there. there's definitely debate, um, certainly on social media. Some people will say, well, it doesn't evoke uh, a blood sugar response, so it's it's irrelevant. But I think more about a cephalic phase insulin response. So this physiologic response to things that are sweet on our tongue. And when I talk about a clean fast, a clean fast incorporates things that I'm pretty certain are not going to evoke an insulin response in the body. And so I think this is very nuanced. Obviously, if you are metabolically healthy, insulin sensitive, I don't think you really have to worry about the nuances of having a little bit of stevia in a feeding, excuse me, a fasting window. But most of my people that follow me and are in programs are not metabolically healthy or they're kind of teetering on that edge. And I do think it can be a differentiator between, you know, clean fasting versus eh, maybe it's a little nuanced type of fasting. So I think for an individual, if you're insulin sensitive, probably not a big deal to have a packet of um, stevia sweetened element. I want to be really clear about that. I don't beat myself up. If I want orange salt, I'm going to have it and I'm not going to feel guilty or badly about it. I think that it's important to just understand the context when we're talking about non-nutritive sweetener. So there was a study that was done in Cell last fall, kind of looking at non-nutritive sweeteners. And it was in a mouse study and it was looking at saccharin, which made me laugh because I was like, was it like 1980s? Like 
tab soda. That's like what my grandmother used to consume. Like who's using saffron? <laughs> um, they were comparing that with um, uh, aspartame and sucralose. And so to me, aspartame and sucralose are these artificial sweeteners. Uh, those I think I would definitely not recommend people consume. They're in a lot of beverages. They're in a lot of shakes. They're in a lot of bars that are out there that seem to be kind of benign. And I say seem to be benign, and I'll put that in air quotes. Um, and then there was also stevia that was used in the study. And the the kind of first thing that it was looking at in a, in a mouse model was how do, how do these sweeteners impact oral glucose tolerance? And within 28 days, there was a negative net impact on oral glucose tolerance, and there was a negative net impact on the gut microbiome. Now, this is a mouse or mice. This is not a human, but when we're looking at animal models, we could likely ex ex uh, kind of extrapolate that there could be the potentiality of um, negative interactions on the gut microbiome and our insulin sensitivity or glucose tolerance for that matter. But I, I don't kind of put stevia in the same bucket as saccharin, sucralose, aspartame. Um, I want to be really clear about that. And I think if you're having three or four element a day, that's very different than someone that's having a lot of highly processed, hyperpalatable foods with a lot of artificial sweeteners in them. And I think it's also, are you someone that's very susceptible to artificial sweeteners? Some people, it just drives the desire for more, 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 more. And I think for individuals that are susceptible, they have to really abstain or really limit their consumption of non nutritive sweeteners along with traditional sweeteners. And so it really begs the question of you have to know yourself. Um, I always like Vinnie Tortorich because he has, you know, the no sugar, no grains. That's kind of his his mindset. And I was at a talk that he gave um, last year. We both spoke at an event and someone said, what's your favorite artificial sweetener? And he said, none. He said, because all you're doing is chasing a problem with another problem. Meaning if you've got a sugar problem, you're better off limiting or eliminating the sugar than trying to find the latest and greatest, whether it's monk fruit, a thyrotol, stevia, et cetera. And so I think we really just have to know ourselves. So again, just kind of getting back to the original intent of answering the question was, if you're not insulin sensitive, if you're dealing with you know uh, hyperinsulinemia or you've got a high blood sugar, then it probably matters what you're consuming in a fasted state, significantly so. If you're metabolically healthy, you're insulin sensitive, I wouldn't worry about a package of element. Um, and, and I'm just using element as the example. Obviously, there's other things that we could use. But I think that's really how it gets really nuanced. And do I on occasion have orange element in a fasted state and feel fine? Absolutely. But I think it's always in the context. But for me personally, I'm, I'm having a combination of unflavored and, and flavored orange salt. That's my favorite. Um, throughout my day. And so I, I think that it's it's really big picture. Like I think sometimes people can get so fixated on minutia that they miss the big picture. And the big picture is, are you insulin sensitive? If the answer is yes, then worry a whole lot less. If you're not, then you got to work on those things because it, it can make a big difference in the success that you have. As you're going through what you eat, when you eat, and you gave us kind of a typical week saying things were a bit different on the weekend, one of the things that jumped out at me was the fact that you have this one day throughout the week where you actually up the protein. And for a lot of us, it already, I'm sure, sounded like you're having quite a bit of protein on a typical day. One thing you didn't get into, though, is why you do that. So what's the reason for that once a week? Well, I think because I've been, I've been fasting for so many years now, it's kind of, you know, you can make the argument I could have more carbohydrates that day or I can have more protein but it's designed to kind of stimulate a little bit more muscle protein synthesis, but also remind my body I'm not I'm not trying to starve it. You know, uh, oftentimes women come to me, and I'll use a woman as an example. Perfect example is a middle aged woman. She's weight loss resistant. If a little bit of fasting is good, more is better. They've been doing OMAD for years. They're mad at me because I'm telling them they're not eating enough food. They're going to break their metabolism effectively, and we have to kind of reverse diet. You know, go back to eating more food because they've gotten to a point where they are not, they're, they're completely plateaued, but they've not been eating enough food for years and years and years. And what ends up happening is their body's like, well, heck, I'm not going to get much food today, so I'm not going to burn any extra calories. There's no point in doing that. And so I think it really begs the conversation about 
making sure you're eating enough food. So for me, it's really kind of giving myself a little, maybe it's a hundred calories more. It's not a ton more protein, but kind of pushing that metric up and working with women that have effectively gotten to a point where they're eating 800 calories a day, maybe 500 calories a day if they're eating one meal. They've just gotten to a point where they've widgeted down so much. That can be destructive. And this is when there's this nuance of some degree of uh, disordered eating. You know, that can play a role. Um, I don't know if you're seeing that in, in some of the talking to some of the guests, if they're seeing similar situations with patients. I have some people are pathologically fearful to eat more than one meal a day. And I always say one meal a day is fine around holiday, vacation, you ate too much, you don't feel good, you're bloated. One meal a day is not a sustainable strategy to be able to hit those protein macros to not end up losing muscle mass at the expense of insulin sensitivity. And so for me, a lot of why I do that is to kind of push that threshold up. Now, have I ever gotten to a point where I had to kind of adjust my macros and make sure I was pushing the envelope? That's why that protein piece is so important. I don't want my body to think that I'm trying to be neglectful or um, I don't track macros. Um, I don't track calories, but I have a, I generally have a very good sense of how much I'm eating. Um, I'll give you a good example. Um, two days ago, super busy day, didn't stop and have lunch. Totally unusual for me. My son had a lacrosse game, didn't eat enough for dinner. And by the next day, I was like, I'm grumpy. I know I'm grumpy because I didn't eat enough food. I can't, I can't, I definitely can't exist like that. So my, your body will definitely let you know. But I think from the perspective of um, if you think you probably aren't eating enough food, you probably are. So I, I think that's an important, an important distinction to make. And, and how many individuals will share with me across social media, they've been doing OMAD for years, males and females. And I'm like, you're probably in a significant caloric deficit and that could be detrimental. And so really having those honest conversations, even if the potentiality exists that it's going to be provocative or make someone uncomfortable or, um, you know, I used to be the co-host of another podcast and we would sometimes get those questions and I would just say, well, if you don't think you're eating enough, you probably are. And so I, I think more often than that, we've already answered the questions for ourselves without having to ask it. It's like, we already know, we just need the validation. Like I mentioned before, I want to make sure we get into insulin. This is a really important piece and something I think we can bring a lot of value to the listener. And I know we're coming up on time. So insulin sensitivity, this is something that you keep bringing up. Talk about what that is and why it matters. So insulin is this wonderful hormone that has largely gotten a really bad rap um, because of this metabolic health base and you know, seeing all these escalating rates of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and PCOS and all these other metabolic diseases. But insulin sensitivity really comes down to when you eat a meal, depending on what macronutrients you've consumed, protein, fat, or carbohydrates, understanding that fat has the most negligible impact on blood sugar um, and subsequently insulin, then protein, then carbohydrates. So if you eat a bowl of ice cream, oh, that's not a good... So you eat a, sit down and eat a bowl of chips you're going to get a much more exaggerated blood sugar response and insulin response than if you eat, I don't know, you eat a stick of butter. I don't know anyone that would do that, but let's just use that as an example. Um, and then understanding that if we are in a state where we're eating like a standard American diet, where we're eating every two to three hours, we're having snacks, we're having mini meals, we're eating six to 10 times a day, that's six to 10 times a day that your blood sugar goes up in response to the meal or the snack your insulin levels go up in response to what you've eaten. And you're not really giving your body time to bring that blood sugar and insulin back down. And when your insulin levels remain high, you are not able to tap into fat stores for energy. And over time, if insulin is, you know, you get kind of get this buffering effect, you know, insulin's a hormone and it's designed to shuttle blood sugar into cells. But if over time, it's over overwhelmed, overworked, your, your cells will actually get resistant to the lock and key mechanism that goes on with this hormone. So instead of shuttling insulin, sorry, so instead of insulin doing its job to take blood sugar and put it in the cell, it just continues to circulate. So then you're, you're dealing with these correspondingly, usually symptoms, you know, these are individuals that may have things like a storage problem with blood sugar in their liver called NOFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They can have skin tags. They may be urinating frequently. They may have changes in their vision. They may have kidney issues. Um, they may become. They will become weight loss resistant over time. 
They may develop high blood pressure. They may have high triglycerides and low HDL. There's a lot of different metrics that we can kind of look at to turn the lever to kind of look at, you know, is there some degree of insulin resistance? But insulin resistance all comes down to this communication problem of getting your blood sugar, taking that glucose molecule and moving it into, into the cells intracellularly. And if you're eating all that, if you're eating frequently, then you're making it harder for your body to be able to properly regulate these hormones. Now, if you're eating two times a day, three times a day, not snacking in between, your body can work much more effectively. It goes, you know, you eat a meal, you have this bolus of protein and carbohydrates, blood sugar goes up to accommodate, insulin goes up, comes back down. You have a load insulin slit, a lowered insulin state throughout the day in between meals you very likely are not falling asleep. You're very likely not having energy crashes. You have sustained ener energy. You've got um, very clear cohesive thoughts. You're not weight loss resistant, generally speaking. And so it's really under it's really helpful to understand that there are many lifestyle meeting things that we do that impact how sensitive our insulin is in terms of communication with ourselves. Things like meal frequency, stress, poor quality sleep, exposure to toxins, over exercising or you know not properly fueling your body doing you know chronic cardio which i'm sure i'll probably get hate mail over um but it's important for people to understand there's a lot that we have under our control but it really starts with understanding that insulin is our friend it is not a bad hormone same same thing with blood sugar glucose is not um is not an enemy either but it's our modern day lifestyles and the ways that we eat that are negatively impacting these hormone pathways and our ability for our bodies to be able to effectively lower our blood sugar, move the blood sugar into the cells, properly regulate these, these key hormones. I mean, there's a lot more that goes on, but I would say that's kind of like the basic thing. So when I talk about metabolic flexibility, it's our body's ability to effectively free up both stored sugar and stored fats as a fuel source. And that's what happens when our insulin levels are low. As we are becoming more metabolically flexible, our body can decide, do I need, am I being chased by a rabid animal and I need to flee? I need quick energy. I'll use those carbohydrates. Nope. I need to run a marathon. I'm going to actually tap or I need to, you know, be very focused on intense intellectual work. I'm taking an exam. Okay. Then, you know, what's going to happen is your body is going to go in and free up these fatty acids. Um, or even, um, another fuel substrate or ketones, which actually diffuse across the blood brain barrier. And our brains really like fat. So a, a lot of what goes on in terms of, you know, doing this switch of talking about metabolic flexibility is understanding that we have a lot under our control, but so much about insulin sensitivity is a byproduct of our lifestyle. So there's a lot that we can do. I want to make sure I, I make that message very clear. There's a lot we can do to improve this. It's not a, you know, once you are no longer insulin sensitive, that that's a, you know, do or die. It's really, that is reversible. Most metabolic diseases, most chronic diseases are completely reversible, but you have to do the work. And this ties back to what we talked about before, where insulin is more sensitive at night versus earlier in the day, as a general statement, overlying what you just said. Yeah. So we're much more insulin sensitive earlier in the day. That's much more aligned with this kind of chronobiologic rhythm in our bodies. So if you're going to have those carbohydrates, I always say, you know, have them in the morning or early afternoon. Don't sit down and have my teenagers do this, but like adults shouldn't do this, like this massive bowl of pasta with a teeny tiny piece of, of like protein. Don't have that right before bed because that's going to make it harder for your body to actually process this massive bolus of carbo processed carbohydrates. Very different than having a sweet potato or, you know, a, you know, an orange or, um, you know, a bowl of berries. Very, very different. I may have said that backwards. You're more insulin sensitive in the morning, less at night. Yes, I knew what you meant. Let's talk about somebody who, in general, has lost that sensitivity. This ties back to the fasting and, and some of the other things we've been talking about. But let's give them a handful of things they can do to start off in a really general sense to work their way back in the beginning. Yeah, I think this is important for people to know that there's definitely a path back. So number one, prioritize protein. It will keep you satiated. Number two, if you know that you are... If you've lost a degree of insulin sensitivity, be mindful of your carbohydrate intake. And by that, I mean, maybe you need to measure your carbohydrate. Maybe you have a quarter cup of berries. I know this will make people mad. Maybe you have half a cup of sweet potato. I mean, you really do have to be mindful. 
I would say intermittent fast, you know, starting with ripping off the Band-Aid and stop snacking, don't eat after dinner, um, you know, maybe you start with 12 or 13 hours of fasting. We know even that confers benefits. I always say 12 hours should be the norm for everyone, irrespective of what life stage they're in. So some degree of intermittent fasting, making sure you're sleeping. Like we know if you get less than six hours a night of sleep, you reduce your ability to control your blood sugar and, and mitigate your blood sugar by up to 60%. It also impacts your leptin and ghrelin um, appetite and satiety hormones, which is really important. I would say hydrate, move your body, like even 10 to 15 minutes of walking after a meal will help mitigate your blood sugar response. Like that should be a bare minimum. I used to, I used to make fun of these couples in my neighborhood that would walk in the evening. Now we become those couples, but it's really because we know there's so many benefits. I mean, literally all you need are shoes to be able to walk after a meal, like get outside, walk for 10 or 15 minutes. I don't care how cold it is. Put a hat on and gloves and, you know, a, a jacket. Or if you want to, you know, really evoke some hormesis, maybe you can be like my husband. He wears like sweatshirts. That's become, I'm like, have you turned into a teenager? Like my teenagers are impervious to coats and so is my husband as of late. So walking after a meal. I think the other thing um, is to get, you know, get hormone levels checked. Like I think this is very important, um, not just sex hormones, but get a fasting insulin checked. Everyone listening should have a fasting insulin drawn a couple times a year gives you a real sense of where you need to be. And we know a fasting insulin will dysregulate way before your blood sugar, way before that A1C that everyone likes to perseverate over. Um, look at inflammatory markers. Um, you know, a fasting insulin is cheap. You know, if you have someone that's not willing to draw it, uh, it you know, it's anywhere from 15 to $20 based on what I've seen online. Um, it's, not a, it's not a functional medicine test. It's not an expensive test, but I think it can be very helpful. And I always say knowledge is power. And then the last thing is understanding that stress also impacts blood sugar, also impacts cortisol, also impacts insulin and try to manage your stress. I'm not saying like a little bit of stress is good, like stress is normal, right? But if you have chronic, unrelenting, uncontrollable stress and it starts from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you go to bed, you got to change something. I don't care if it's you take five minutes at the end of your day to read a book locked in your bathroom because you got little kids. I remember those days. Maybe it's you get you hire a sitter so that you have an hour to yourself once or twice a week if you're a single parent or you don't have a lot of um, family support. But finding time to be able to pri prioritize doing something that brings you joy is going to be very, very important. And so I think those are the things I would probably start with because I know we started the conversation saying, it's overwhelming when you think about all the things, but it really does start with food. Um, what we eat and when we eat really matters. And those two metrics alone can have a profoundly impactful impact on blood sugar variability as well as insulin sensitivity. I want to highlight something you brought up there that's really important. The fact that getting an insulin test done fasted, the importance of that, because what can happen in the body if you're only measuring blood glucose and then using that as your measurement of your metabolic health, over time, as you're becoming more insulin resistant, the body's just going to make more insulin to keep that blood glucose at bay. And if all you're measuring is the glucose, you're going to think you're fine. But in the background for years and years, you can be insulin resistant and, and all kinds of health complications can be happening in the background. Yeah. I think, you know, when I finished my nurse practitioner program, Back in the 2000, 2001 timeframe, we used to say that patients with a blood sugar under 140 were good. Now it's under 100. So at least we're, we're heading in the right direction. But that gray area of how many women I see that are really scooching towards being insulin resistant, it's not yet showing up on their A1C, which is a 90-day snapshot of blood sugar control. Their blood sugar is a little higher than I want it to be. And even checking at home, it's not where it should be. And then we draw fasting insulin and the light bulb goes off. It's like, oh, your fasting insulin is 20. Well, well, now I know why you're not losing weight. You know, talk about fasting insulin's high. Guess what? You're not going to be able to tap into fat stores. So helping people understand that fasting insulin can be a huge, a hugely insightful lab value to be looking at that is inexpensive, very valuable. I track my own. Like I know what my fasting insulins have been over the last four or five years because it kind of gives me a sense of, you know, what direction my thyroid is going into. 
But I think it's helpful for people to know you can ask for these tests. This is a test that's covered by insurance. This may be helpful for helping you uncover what's really going on below the surface. And so I think that that should be standard of care. Unfortunately, it's not. There's still a lot of providers that just do A1Cs. And I'm like, well, that's great. That doesn't tell me a lot. Oh, that looked good. Okay. Before we part ways, we'll end on this. And this ties back to something you talked about before, where putting on muscle is actually going to help us regulate glucose as well. So just coming full circle and tying that into this part of the conversation of ways to manage blood glucose. So think about your muscles as like a glucose reservoir. You know, every time you're building muscle, you are building opportunities for your body to be able to dispose of of glucose. And so for all those people out there who are fearful, they don't want to look too muscular. Well, as an example, women just don't have enough circulating testosterone to ever look like a man. Like that's, that's physiologically impossible unless you're taking exogenous steroids. And that's a whole separate conversation. But it's helpful for people to understand that the more muscle mass you have, the more muscle we have on our body, skeletal muscle, the more likely you are to be insulin sensitive. And that is incredibly impactful and important as we are getting older. If you take nothing else away from our conversation, muscle really is critically important for metabolic health. Think of it as a sponge for for blood sugar. Think of it as sponge for your glucose and that the more muscle we have, the less we have to worry about your your insulin levels not being optimized. So something to really think about. And, and the other thing to kind of tie into that is as we are getting older and as we're having all these sex hormone fluctuations that do occur with, with normal functions of aging, don't be fearful if you've done all the other work to consider hormone replacement therapy. Have a conversation with your GYN or your internist understand that um, the Women's Health Initiative that came out around 2002, which I was largely insulated with being in cardiology, but now understand a whole lot better. We have a whole generation of clinicians that are fearful to talk about prescribing and prescribing hormones when for many individuals, whether it's male or female, one of the things that they can benefit from in terms of insulin sensitivity, if they've done all the other work, like all of it, and they still need a little bit support that having a bit of estradiol, and progesterone and possibly testosterone and board can make a big difference, big, big difference in all these lifestyle pieces that we've talked about today. And I believe, Cynthia, last time we talked, you mentioned you were using a cream, a progesterone cream. Is that still part of your part of your healthy routine? Well, I, I use oral progesterone um, six nights a week. And um, I was taking a break from the HRT I was on because I had been like, I, I was on too much. And so it was like kind of having this wash down. So now I have an estrogen patch and I have a cream testosterone. And so I'm on all three. About 75% of women don't make enough testosterone in menopause to be able to kind of get by without it. Um, 25% of women do. And so I always say testosterone, you might be one of those people, those magical unicorns that don't need that. But that for me has been very helpful for continuing to build muscle and I know we could have a whole tangential conversation, but very value individual, work with a practitioner that knows what they're doing so that you can ensure you're getting the support that you deserve to have. Well, thank you for being honest about that because as somebody, we can clearly hear and see that you're you're doing all the things and, and you've gone to that as an adjunct to the healthy lifestyle you're living. So really important to share. Cynthia, really love the conversation. We're gonna link up your book in the show notes. We're gonna link up your website, your social media. Really appreciate you come back on the show. Thank you. No, it's been a joy. Thank you again. Now that you're done my conversation with Cynthia, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Mindy. She's going to share some other fasting mistakes you're going to want to avoid. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. And for weight loss, just so we're clear, my favorite fast is a 36-hour fast. I have seen it unstick.